God sent His only Son to die for me, His perfect love to show. So when He calls me, I will follow. Where He leads me, I will go. Faithful I will be. Faithful I will be. I will praise the God of love for His faithfulness to me. So as He leads me day by day, His praises I will sing. For in Christ I have the victory, through Him I can do all things. faithfulness to me. All His words are true. His promises are sure. Forever He reigns. Forever His word will Truly, that's what God calls us to be, and we have no excuse, but we can be found faithful. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I hope that that would be your heart's prayer, that in every way, that you would be faithful to God. We've heard a lot of truth this week, haven't we? I hope you've made some decisions. Maybe you didn't walk down an aisle, but in your heart you made some decisions or some commitments, or maybe you confessed some sin. Don't you want to be faithful in those things? God is always faithful to us. We fail him every day. And I'm so thankful when I fail, one of the faithful things is I have to get back up. And hopefully you've gotten back up this week. For some of you, maybe uh, your heart's desire is not to be faithful to God. There's a big question mark that you should have in your heart and in your mind if you're not even desiring to be faithful to God. Matter of fact, the Bible, the Bible clearly teaches if Christ is in you, you will have a desire to live for God. Oh, you won't be perfect, you won't be all that you should be, and you will struggle at times, but if there's absolutely no desire to be faithful to God, to serve the Lord, you better check to see if you're really in the family of God. He wants to save you by his faithfulness. The song we're going to sing is a, just a simple song about serving the Lord, and God um, could, could do without us. Do you realize that? God could do his work without us, but what a privilege, isn't it, to know that God has saved us, and he wants us to serve him. And that we have the privilege of being a part of God's business, being a part of the work in the world, and uh, helping the kingdom of God, all because of God and his power in our life. And I hope it will be our prayer and desire to serve the Lord for the entirety of our lives, for the rest of our days. Here in the presence of the Lord, here in this holy place, giving him thanks for all he's done, quietly seeking his face. So many times we've seen his hand guiding each step of the way. God put us here to take a stand, to serve him every day. We will serve him 
for the rest of our days. We will serve him with the highest of praise. We'll be his witness no matter the cost. We'll be his beacon, his light to the lost. We will serve the Lord our God for the rest of our days. He is the light at break of dawn. He is the one true way. He is our strength when hope is gone. Shepherds us when we stray. God gave to us his only son, a selfless sacrifice. How can we pay for all he's done when Jesus paid the price? We will serve him for the rest of our days. We will serve him with the highest of praise. We'll be his witness no matter the cost. We'll be his beacon, his light to the lost. We will serve the Lord our God. We will serve the Lord our God. We will serve him for the rest of our days. We will serve him with the highest of praise. We'll be his witness no matter the cost. We'll be his beacon, his light to the lost. We will serve the Lord our God for the rest of our days. The rest of our days. We always look forward to coming back to Central Baptist Church. And uh, we love you folks and we're thankful for the opportunity it's been to be here it just doesn't seem right because it seems like our kids were just uh, in elementary school. I was talking to several people this week, and, um, and here we are, and they're graduating from college now. Please pray for our family. We have an emotional year ahead of us. We have one that's graduating from high school. That's McKenna. And then we have two that are uh, graduating from Maranatha Baptist University. That's Micah and Malachi. Micah finished in December, but he's going to march in, in May, and his brother's right behind him. He's going to march in May as well. And, and then we have um, a wedding coming up August 20th. Y'all are, are, are all invited if you want to come. It's going to be in Wisconsin. But um, anyway, if you want to come, you can come. I should have asked him, though. Uh, maybe I, anyway, uh, ask Micah. I'm sure you can come. But um, that's exciting. And then my wife and I are becoming empty nesters this year. And uh, that's emotional as well. And I've talked to many people that, that are always looking forward to being empty nesters. We haven't had that spirit yet. It hasn't quite arrived. We, we, miss, we will miss, we miss the kids that aren't with us, and we will miss the ones when they're all gone. But I'm sure the Lord will transition us well. So you pray for us in that uh, song, Be Still My Soul, in every change he faithful will remain. God has been so faithful to us. We're so thankful for what he's done in our lives and uh, for how he's brought us to this point. But you can be praying for the Herbster family. You can also be praying for our ministry, Southland Christian Camp Ministry. Um, we have a lot going on there, and we need, your, we, we need your prayers. We covet your prayers for our summer ministry especially, and for the 70 staff members that will be coming in, and for the about 2,500 campers that will be coming to the camp, for the preachers that will preach. If you're interested at all in any of that, you can go to our website or follow us on social media. We'd love for you to do that. We have a lot of vision, a lot of hope to continue to spread the truth of the Word of God, to uh, partner with local churches just like yours, and, but a lot of them much closer even down in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, etc., and uh, continue to propagate the gospel and tell kids, young people, that it's worth living for God. Loving God and living, God, living for God is the best thing that you can do with your life, and we want to represent that well through Southland Christian Camp Ministry. We want to stay faithful as we sang about a moment ago, and so we, we would covet your prayers. 
And uh, as uh, was mentioned, we'll be starting a couples retreat tomorrow and then followed by a family conference at our church where we'll get to just sit and soak in from evangelist Dave Young. We'll look forward to that. And then a, a, a second couples retreat as well. And both of those couples retreats are packed full and we're excited about the opportunity to serve those couples that will be coming. How many of you have been faithful to the meeting every single night you've been here? You've been here. Raise your hand. Praise the Lord, Pastor. There's a lot of hands being raised. That is wonderful. Don't let that faithfulness die. Every time the church doors are open, you should be here, right? Amen? Now, for some of you, you might not have um, normally attended these services, but maybe that's revival for you is that you came Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. Just continue to see God revive your heart as you sit under the preaching of the Word of God. We especially want to thank those that have been here every single night. We appreciate um, your faithfulness to the Lord. As Pastor mentioned also, revival doesn't have to be just during the revival meeting. I pray that the passion for God would remain, that the power of God would remain fresh in your heart and in your life and in this church, and that there would be a, a, a persuasiveness about you and your life a contagiousness about your walk with God, your life lived for Christ. And tonight, I want to kind of conclude the meeting with that type of a focus. And here we are in Acts chapter 26. And before we get to the text of Scripture, years ago when we would go into a big game, our school, our Christian school in Kansas City, we would have a, what's called a pep rally. How many of you know what a pep rally is? All right, It's where the entire school came. The players would get in their uniforms or their, their warm-ups. The cheerleaders were there, and, and we had a pep band, and it got us all hyped up, right? It got us all excited. It got us all encouraged for the game. Now, there's a huge difference between that, obviously, pepping up somebody for a, a sporting event. What we're going to talk about tonight is maybe a pep rally that's for something much more important. Matter of fact, it is the main thing that we should all be really passionate for in, in our lives. And I want to, in a sense, at the close of this meeting, just hype us in a righteous kind of way? Can I say it that way? I don't want to manipulate, but I want you to recognize how important this is and charge you up to go out and do more in this area of your life. Some of you are already trying to think about what that is. Well, you'll, you'll see it in just a moment, okay? Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 is a text where we find the Apostle Paul standing before trial. If you study the book of Acts, it's when the church is charging forward. By the way, his truth will keep marching on. The church still needs to be charging forward. And the book of Acts is the story of the church and how it charged forward in this, in this day through the apostles' work and ministry. And the apostle Paul was a huge part of that along with some of the other apostles. And here at the end of the book of Acts, we know that in, starting in verse, uh, verse chapter 21, he goes to Jerusalem and he knows that there's going to be danger and persecution at Jerusalem, but he goes anyway because God calls him to do so, to preach the gospel. And in verse 17 and beyond, he's arrested and he starts to stand trial. And in each one of the different aspects of the trial, the criminal trial for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul takes the opportunity to share his life life's work, his testimony, and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's really a fascinating uh, study as you read through the story of the trial itself. Several different times in, that, um, in these trials, he actually goes back and he recounts his salvation testimony, and he shares it with the intent of those that are hearing it to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's where we find in chapter 26, in, in, starting in verse 12, he's doing this again before King Agrippa. It's as if he has his last will and testament, and what he wants to talk about is Jesus Christ. That's really encouraging. In verse 12, it says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven and above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. 
But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Say those three words with me. For this purpose. One more time, a little stronger. Here we go. For this purpose. I believe God, through Jesus, has appeared to you for this purpose as well. Now, you're not an apostle. You didn't see the risen Christ. But you're a saved saint, Christian, and he saves us for this purpose as well. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of these things in which I shall, and of those things which I shall appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. But showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For those causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show, shed, show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. I think what we find in this text of Scripture is the mission for the Apostle Paul and the mission for God's people. You know, companies, great companies, understand that they need to teach and train and, and bring to light the mission of their organization to their employees. Maybe some of you have had that experience in the companies that you've worked with. We have a mission statement in our ministry at Southland, and in a few weeks and when uh, people come, we'll actually, we actually have all of the summer staff memorize that mission statement, and then we walk through every aspect of that mission statement, helping everybody to get on the same page. The mission statement helps everybody know, clarify what their goals, what their, what their desire is for um, the summer, in, in our case, or for company situation for their business. Let me give you a couple popular mission statements and see if you can uh, tell me what they are. To nurture the human spirit one cup, one neighborhood at a time. That's the mission statement for? Anybody know? Starbucks, that's right. There is one in Greenville. My wife loves Starbucks, and, and I, I would say I do too. We've mastered the art of taking the four-buck drink and turning it into a much more reasonable, we both like the same thing, and so we go and we get a Trenta iced coffee, and we do it without ice. It's an iced coffee without ice, go figure. And then we, we put cream, and we put uh, sugar-free vanilla syrup in it, and we get the real big one, and then we ask them for two cups of ice on the side. Come on, amen? That's, that's frugal right there. By the way, once you get to a point where you're a Starbucks Gold member, and I think that if you use the app, it's after a certain amount of dollars that you spend, and, and you never go back on that. By once you're a Gold member, I think you're always a Gold member. Um, and maybe you didn't know this, and so I'm, I'm informing you of this now. And you can actually then go back and get a refill on your iced coffee and take it home for the next day. So what we do is we go on a date, we sit there and we drink our iced coffee and then go back and we get a refill of iced coffee with no ice and we take it home and we mix it at home using the same, uh, wash the cups, but we use the same cups and uh, we, we mix it at home and take, that's the way to make, take advantage, right, of, of the company Starbucks that's making, you say, my brother one time said to me, Mike, that's unethical. No, I said to him, I actually tell the people what we're doing. So lest anybody thinks I'm being unethical, I tell them, my wife and I are going to split that, so we need two cups of ice. That's how I order every single time. Just wanted to clarify. But they've done a pretty good job turning a cup of coffee into being hip and faddish, don't you think? I mean, when I was a kid in college even, old people drank coffee. Now, elementary school kids are drinking coffee. And if you aren't drinking coffee, you just ain't cool. And... I found out this week, if I don't drink it black, I'm not a man. <laughs> but anyway, we won't go there. So that's a mission statement they've done a pretty good job with. Here's another mission statement. To nurture and inspire and innovate every athlete in the world. And if you are, if you are a human, you are an athlete. Oh, I said it wrong. If you have a body, you are an athlete. Anybody know what that is? The company is Nike. Nike. Nike knows that if you are living and breathing and have a body, that's everybody, you are an athlete. <laughs> I think this is actually pretty humorous. 
Because they make everybody think if they put on Nike paraphernalia, they're an athlete. It turns them into an athlete. I don't know if that's true or not, but they've done a pretty good job. Now, this is no advertisement for Nike or for Starbucks, and we're not endorsing either one of them. That's that little text that's at the bottom of the screen, okay? All I'm saying is that if companies like that know that they have a mission that needs to be accomplished, then we as God's people on earth need to know our mission that needs to be accomplished. And that mission is the Great Commission. The commission by God to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the world, into the, into the world. The, now, you might say, Brother Mike, I don't think it's the main thing because the main thing is actually to glorify God. And if you are thinking that, you are absolutely right. But the main thing to glorify God cannot be done if we are not propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, okay, I give it to you that glorifying God is the th supreme purpose of mankind. It really is. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Those who do not have Christ cannot glorify God properly, but everybody has the same purpose in life. Did you know that? And until they receive Jesus Christ, they cannot fulfill that purpose. And if you're here without Christ, I want to encourage you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight. You can't glorify God properly in your life without Him. And then once He comes into our life, the Bible says we can have the power to glorify our Savior, and it's our choice to do so. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And part of that glorifying work is our life of testimony and our lips that share the gospel message. So I love this text of Scripture in Acts 26 because here's the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest evangelists, greatest soul winners, greatest preachers, probably one of the greatest Christians known to mankind. God turned him from a persecutor and a killer of Christians into a proclaimer of the gospel and a preacher for Christians. That's an unbelievable transformation. You say, if you're here tonight and you say, I've just done too many bad things, or anybody in the world ever says, I've just done too many bad things, I guarantee you they weren't as bad as the Apostle Paul. God changed him through the gospel. I guarantee it wasn't as bad as the woman at the well. God changed her through Jesus' conversation and being, being uh, the water of life that saved her soul. God saved the demoniac of Gadara. God took a demon-possessed man and saved him. There's no excuse. There's no sin that God can't forgive through his son, Jesus Christ. And I just want to challenge you, if you're here tonight and you don't know for sure you're on your way to heaven, I want to be a gospel proclaimer through this message about being gospel, gospel proclaimers. I want to tell you that Jesus is the only way and he can save you tonight. It's a free gift offered. And we'll say more about that in a second. So I want to just charge us up. I want to have a little pep rally about what our purpose is. And it's to glorify God and by glorifying God, by sharing and showing the truth of the gospel in our life. Notice with me here in chapter 26, where we began our reading, and again, he's sharing his testimony, that on the road to Damascus, when Jesus met, uh, when G uh, Paul met Jesus, I believe he got saved at, in verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? He acknowledged him as the Lord at that, that point. And, and he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Here's the purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Number one tonight, I want you to notice the mission commanded. The mission commanded. God saved the Apostle Paul, and the moment he saved him, he said, this is the reason I saved you. I command you to be a minister and a witness. Two things that he talks about there. A minister is a servant. A minister is a person who loves others more than they love themselves. They're serving the Lord by serving other people. So getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto the needs of other people is commanded by God. And the greatest need that every person in the world has is the need of Jesus Christ to be their Savior. And so in serving, being a servant, the greatest thing that we can do is share our faith and care for the needs of other people. We live in a society that is, in its, in its humanism, building up mankind, building up uh, our own egos. Humanism is all over, and uh, people are, are very rarely wanting to serve other people. Have you noticed 
That especially over the uh, past several years that the customer service in places where people are paid to give us customer service, that we don't get very good customer service in the United States of America. If you're in, any of you are in any kind of customer service um, arena as far as your work, can I just challenge you? You're getting paid to serve the customer. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like you were bothering the one that was supposed to be serving you, right? <laughs> That's very, very frustrating. You go to many other places around the world, they've learned how to serve way better. And their customer service is way better. Years ago, I was in the country of Japan. And let me just tell you something. In Japan, they have very, very good sushi. I love sushi. We had some good sushi on Sunday night. Brother, I learned Brother Brad does not like, he's already rubbing his head right there. He does not like sushi. But there's some really good sushi in, in Japan. And by the way, that was some really good sushi in town. What's that place called? Vonda. Novas. Vondas, not Vondas, Novas, Novas. Any, any of you like sushi out there? All right. What I found in Japan is that the customer service was over the top. I mean, it was unbelievable. From Starbucks to McDonald's over there to the nice sushi places to the, the places where you got your, your ramen and the other things that they serve, all the sea, sea, seaweed and uh, the fish and, you know, everything else over there. Their customer service was over the top. I don't know exactly what makes the difference, but we got to get our eyes off of ourselves and serve others. Now, there, there's a big difference between ser serving somebody Chick-fil-A, my pleasure, and giving somebody the gospel. There's a big difference. But there's a sense in which we've been bought with a price, right? Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belong to God. If he has really transformed our lives and saved us, then we should be seeking to serve the people that haven't received that yet. Now, I do believe that we should be serving one another, and that's absolutely central to the truth of the, the scriptures, loving one another, uh, serving one another in the church. And that is a whole other message. I'm amazed at how selfish people are. They come in and out of church, never one time think about somebody else. When you come in and out of church, may that never be said about you. May you constantly be looking for somebody to serve other than just serving yourself. We naturally do that. But when we leave the church, it's important. We don't stop serving our brothers and sisters in Christ and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. But when we go outside the walls of this church and out these doors in the different directions and we go to where God has called us into our sphere of influence, we ought to be looking to serve the people around us by sharing our faith and showing our faith. All right, so we are to be a minister. He that is greatest of you is he that ministers. And a witness. A witness is a person who gets on, uh, on, on trial and he gets up and he says, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And he witnesses to an event or a crime or whatever, right? Well, Paul is, is being called by, Saul at this point, is being called by God to witness what he's experiencing in his own testimony, in his own experience, and notice what it says here, both of these things, which thou hast not just seen, that would be your conversion experience. If you've been converted, say amen. amen. You need to be sharing that. You need to be witnessing to somebody else about your conversion experience. And then he says, and of those things into which I will appear unto thee. Now, we don't have the privilege that the Apostle Paul had where um, God himself spoke through him. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we have penned for us the witness of the Apostle Paul. How many of you are glad he was faithful to that, to that calling? And so what he's given to us in Scripture is in obedience to this command to be a witness of the things in which I will appear to thee. And can I just say that what he, appear, what he appeared to the Apostle Paul and then Paul wrote down is also what we can give. The Word of God is, is what, what does the work. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Share your testimony and share the Word of God. You need to know verses. You need to know Scripture that can lead you, lead people to understand their need of Christ and make it as simple and plain as, as possible. You need to pick up gospel tracts that have it already laid out for you. And you can actually walk right through it so that you don't even necessarily have to memorize it. But it's important that we know the Scripture and we point them to the Scripture. It's not our words, it's God's words that matters. And we become a witness of what God has done for us. You know, I often wonder for myself, because we all struggle with this, and we could all go out of here tonight knowing that we can do better at this, right? There's a whole world that's lost and dying. Why do I walk by people that I know God wants me to witness to and I don't witness to them? That's a good question. You need to ask yourself that. Why are you not 
being a witness. What is keeping you? Is it your pride? Is it seeking to be a people pleaser? Are you afraid of what they're going to think of you or what they're going to do to you? Are you concerned about the politically correct society around you? What is it that's keeping you? You don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. we got to set all those things aside because we are commanded by God to be a servant and a soul winner, a witness for Jesus Christ, the mission commanded. Second of all, I want you to notice the mission communicated. This comes to us in verse uh, 18 in particular. He's going to send him to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What is it that we are supposed to communicate? What is the mission particularly? It is number one to be an eye opener. The mission communicated is to be an eye opener. Um, there are times when I'll watch something like on social media or on YouTube or sometimes in the news that's just like, are you kidding? Did that really happen when my eyes get really big? That's what it means to be an eye, uh, to be an eye opener. And folks, what we need to recognize that everybody that's still in their sin is, is blinded. I once was lost. I was blind, but now I see amazing grace. And I'm glad that somebody took the time to help take the blinders off and help me see that I needed to be saved. And we are to be eye-openers. Now, this is, this is difficult in the day in which we live, but it is possible with God and with your testimony and with your, with your, your witness that you, when you share your faith in the midst of this uh, very crazy world in which we live where people are saying, just believe whatever you want and you'll get there, that's really popular, but it's not biblical. And we need to be willing to be an eye-opener. Sometimes when people have grown up in false religions and they've grown up in, and their families are all in one way, it's a real eye-opener to direct them to the truth that exclusively Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But it is our responsibility and the power of God to be used of God to help open their eyes. Now, lest anybody stop and think that I'm making salvation of somebody else um, man-centered or uh, based upon your witness. That's not at all what I'm, what I'm saying. But there is Old Testament and New Testament text that helps us to understand that we are to be watchmen, Old Testament book of Ezekiel. We are to be soul winners. We are to be used of God. I don't know how that perfectly works together with God and his will and his sovereignty, how that he wants to use us to share the testimony of who Jesus is but that's what Paul was called to do, and that's what you are called to do. And he says this, to open their eyes, be an, be an eye-opener, and to turn them from darkness to light. Be a light-bearer. We live in a dark world, and the light seems to be getting dimmer and dimmer. It's time for God's people that have the true light to light it into the world. Shine it upon the neighborhood. Let your light so shine. The Bible was very, very clear. The dark room if a candle is lit, bring some light. If I were to turn out all the lights in here and one person had a candle that was lit, that would give a little bit of light, but probably not enough light. We could try this with our phones tonight, but we won't do that. Um, yeah, they do that in stadiums, don't they, sometimes? And one of those lights does light a little bit, but how much better if everybody has their, their light lit up? It would, it would transform the room if everybody took out their phone, and not just one, and turned on their, their little flashlight. That's very handy, isn't it? We all use that a lot. Or if we had the old-style way with a candle, it would happen the same way. There is none of us in here that shouldn't be lighting our light, our candle, letting it shine in, in, in the world and in the neighborhood, in the darkness of this world. And look, that is the light of your testimony. We've talked a lot about this this week as far as the way that we live and, and how our lives are to be different from the world. What makes you think your light is shining if you're exactly like the world? Now, we need to be different on purpose and let our light through our good works, our works don't save us, but our works validate our salvation. So when you go to work, there should be a difference about you and in you shining a different lifestyle, different language, different loves, and different entertainment, and different music, and different marriages, and different families. Do I need to keep going? All should be different, and when you do, you're letting your light shine. But I am not one of those preachers that is just going to tell you, just let your testimony shine. No, you need to let your words shine the light of Jesus Christ. You need to talk, engage people in conversation, which brings us to the next part 
and turn them from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. We need to be a truth teller. So the difference between God and the devil is that God never lies and the devil always lies. Boy, I tell you what, I am so frustrated with all the lies that are going on in the world. It's really, really hard to know who to trust anymore, right? And especially when it comes to world affairs and, and to politics and to the economy and to, there's a bunch of lying going on. What we know about God is that he never lies. Grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This book is true from cover to cover, and God will always tell the truth. Let God be truth and every man a liar, Romans says. But we do know that the devil is a liar, and he is going out trying to deceive and destroy and to tear down what, what God's people are seeking to do and what God is trying to do. Now, ultimately, we sang a victory in Jesus. Ultimately, the victory is going to be the Lord's. But while we're on earth, the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He's the king, of the king of this world, in a sense. God is greater. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But for a time, God is allowing the devil to deceive people. And he wants you to be the person that helps open their eyes, shine the light, and speak the truth. So in order for us to do this, we do have to understand a little bit about what's going on in the world and what's causing people to reject Christ. I think it's important that we would understand some of the false religions. I'm not saying you have to go and get a degree in one of those false, educate, uh, false religions. But we ought to know some targeted areas to talk about when it comes to the truth of Jesus Christ. And I think it's important for us to, to think about that. One is you can always talk about Jesus. Because Jesus really did live. He's, a, not, he's not just a Bible figure, though that's enough. He's a historical figure, and everybody knows that Jesus really lived. So you have to do something with Jesus. If you're ever wondering where to start, just ask them what they believe about Jesus. That's a great place to start, right? Because there's all this convoluted stuff about who Jesus was. Jesus is way different, and you need to know why, and you need to know how to talk about why Jesus is different than Muhammad and Buddha and the other gods of this world. Jesus is not just a good person and just a good prophet. He is God in human form. And you need to know where to go and, and how to share that with people because that makes the truth of Jesus the truth because he proved it. And ultimately, the greatest proof of the truth of Jesus is the resurrection, which we're going to celebrate in just a few weeks on, on Easter. I love that, that holiday, that holy day of Easter. But Jesus proved that he was God. He said he was God. He proved that he was God. He did miracles that nobody else could do. And ultimately, he raised himself from the grave. He was born of a virgin, and there were many other things. Old Testament prophecies perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. These are great, simple tools to talk about that are just, just filtered away in false religions. The second thing you can always talk about is what people believe as far as the afterlife and how they're getting to heaven. 99% of all the false religions, folks, believe a works-based salvation. They believe their salvation is centered upon them and not on Jesus. And this is deceptive, and it's damning, and it's dangerous, and the devil's bringing it in by way of false religion. See, naturally bent in the heart of every person is a God consciousness. Now, they can suppress that God consciousness, but mark it down. God is at work in every heart as, as trying to direct them to a God awareness. So what the devil does very craftily, very slyly, is he brings all these religions so that people are now pursuing God, but they're pursuing God in all the wrong ways, through the lies of the devil, and in their own understanding, and in their own works. The Bible is so clear. We are not saved by our works. We're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, by his grace alone. It's so simple. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, if you're here without Christ, can I declare the gospel to you? You cannot do anything to merit salvation. You must simply by faith believe and receive the gift of salvation. And tonight can be the night for you. You don't have to get baptized in this church. You don't have to join this church. You don't have to go to this church. I hope you will. And I hope you will eventually get baptized. But baptism doesn't save you. Doing good works doesn't save you. Giving to your church doesn't save you. No, Jesus alone saved you. 
I always found that interesting. Can you imagine if we did have to work our way to heaven? Can you imagine? Every day I'd be wondering if I did enough. And every day I'd probably want to get resaved over and over and over again because I did something wrong. Oh, I'm not going to get there. It would be so discouraging if we had to try to make sure that all of our works were perfectly aligned in order for us to go into heaven. You know, I find it also very intriguing that these false religions, they have kind of roped people in by these, this works-based salvation, and they, they get a lot of money through that, they get a lot of following through that, but it's not the truth. You're only saved by grace in Jesus Christ. So two things you can really talk about to declare the truth of God in the midst of this, the lies of the world and this postmodern thinking, and that is talk about Jesus and talk about that faith is not through works. Faith is through Jesus Christ, and it's a free gift offered to all. I find it interesting how the devil can take something that's so simple, so plain, and so free, and he can mess it all up in people's lives. And God wants you and I to be the ones to help tell them the truth, open their eyes, shine the light, and share the gift, which is the final point here. And they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, obviously, God is the one who has shared the gift. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is God who has given the gift, but God has given you the gift so that you will then share that gift, that potential to receive the gift, the forgiveness of sins in the lives of those that are in your sphere of influence. There are people in your world, folks, that your pastor will never meet people that for sure I will never meet. God has placed you where you are and has saved you the way he has so that you can do what verse 18 says. Every one of us need to be faithful to this mission. It's been communicated to us. It's been commanded. I want you to notice, finally, the mission concluded. And I find this interesting. Here he is at the end of his life, and he's going to jail. Eventually he's going to die uh, for the cause of Christ and for preaching the gospel. And he says here, right face to face with King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. Now, do you think that means that the Apostle Paul witnessed to every single person he should have ever witnessed to? No, I don't believe that's at all what he's saying. He was a human just like you and me. But I think he was able to say at the end of his life, I fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. He confidently said that he had done in all that he knew he could do, he had done his best for Jesus in being faithful to that calling upon his life. Could you say that at the end of your life? Will you be able to say that? That'd be a great thing to be able to say, wouldn't it? That you wouldn't, weren't disobedient to that heavenly vision? But notice, showed first unto them at Damascus, so immediately in the context of his vicinity and the locality that he was immediately in, he, he went in and he shared the gospel. And then at Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. I find that you will never get a burden for the people of the world if you can't get a burden for the person right across the street or right at your workplace or the person that you meet at, at the restaurant. See, it starts right where you are. Oh, I believe it's awesome to go on short-term missions trips and to have a burden for the world and to give to missions and, and to uh, pray for missions, but it's important that you be the missionary, that you be a person that's active in sharing the gospel in, in your local vicinity, in your surrounding communities, in your state, in our country, yes, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Paul was faithful to that. You say, how does that exactly happen? Well, each one reaching one, you never know where that one you reach is going to reach somebody else. And then they're going to reach somebody else. And then they're going to reach somebody else. And before long, your gospel witness has gone to the uttermost parts of the country, possibly even to the world, just because you're being faithful right where you are. So even if you can't go to the foreign field, you're in investing in the foreign field by investing personally in the people that are right around you. It's super important for us to be able to have, uh, you know, in the end of our life, this idea, this thought process of I want to know, I want to be able to know that I was faithful to this heavenly calling, this mission upon my life. Having therefore obtained help of God, let us not forget, we cannot do what we need to do as gospel witnesses for the Lord, as Christians in this dark world without the help of God. That's a very important phrase. 
We need God's help. This is not us just uh, advancing things on our, on our own. We need to walk with God, live in his power, and God will help us to be faithful. I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. He's very simply saying, this is all you need to say. I was faithful to just say, Jesus is God, that he suffered, bled, and died, and that he rose from the grave, and he did that for you. And he thus spoke in verse 24, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Now, you might not have had somebody actually say those exact words to you, but how many of you have ever had somebody slam the door when you were at a door witnessing? Or somebody at work kind of roll their eyes? It's kind of like what, what happened here. Festus is like, are you serious? You are mad. And sometimes we get turned away in our witness because people refuse it and reject it. We can't be that way. Paul wasn't right here. Paul, thou art beside thyself and, and mad, verse 25. But Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. I find that's an interesting part of the text where he's actually speaking specifically to King Agrippa and saying, in essence, King Agrippa, you know about Jesus. You know that Jesus raised himself from the grave. This isn't, this isn't something new to you. He's basically referencing that and, and kind of persuading King Agrippa, even though Festus was trying to pour, pour cold water on his witness. You see that? Don't let others pour cold water on your witness. Just continue to speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. He's referencing what was going on in the world. And he, King Agrippa knew what had happened with Jesus. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Now, in the, in the conclusion here, what we're seeing is that he's becoming very persuasive. He's saying, hey, won't you believe the prophets? I know that thou believest. He's appealing to the fact that he believes that King Agrippa should be at a point where he should believe right now. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Some of the saddest verse, saddest words in the New Testament. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But notice it says persuadest. Again, we don't do the saving. God does. I, years ago, I was in a children's meeting, and a kid got saved in the children's meeting as we gave the gospel in our revival meetings years ago. Years ago. And uh, after the service, after I led him to Christ and we had prayed and he came out and he was introducing me to his dad and he, he said, hey, daddy, daddy, this is the man that saved me. And I immediately stopped and I said, I knew what he was talking about, obviously, but I wanted to make, make it very clear to the young boy that I wasn't the one that saved him. It was God that saved him. I was just the vessel that shared it with him. So obviously we are not saying that, that, uh, that we are the ones that are doing the sa saving, but you cannot get away from the fact that Paul was seeking to be persuasive. You cannot be persuasive of things that you don't know. You cannot be persuasive when you don't know what to say. You can't be persuasive if you aren't living a life for Christ and your lifestyle isn't demonstrating that Christ has made a difference in your life. But if you are living for Christ and you are knowing where to go in the Scripture and you have some memorization of Scripture and you maybe have a track with you, be persuasive, lovingly persuasive. You know, I hope you know what I mean. I'm not saying that we should tie tracks to rocks and throw them in people's yards and that we should be witnessing and persuading every single person that we, sh we, should ever, that we ever come in contact with and we're, we're seeking to... It's impossible to do. I'm talking about when the Spirit says, give a witness... And you're in a conversation and you can serve and you can care for that person and you have the time to communicate with them the, the truth of the gospel, which sometimes simply through a track, sometimes you can walk through the track, sometimes you can sit down with them in their home. That we ought to seek to bring them to a point of decision and seek to ask them to believe because it's a free gift. We can share that gift, be a light bearer, a truth teller. And that's sad, a sad verse. We understand that that's going to be sad for us too when we give the gospel and somebody that we're seeking to persuade, they don't get saved. But the Bible says some plant, others water, God gives the increase. You don't know where that seed will go and who's going to be the next person to water that seed and take it to the next, next level in the heart of that, that person. You just need to be faithful when God in your heart draws you to an understanding to be faithful. 
Now, as we conclude, flip over to chapter 28 real quick, because this is so interesting. And, and for me, it's very encouraging. The Apostle Paul didn't quit giving the gospel. Even when he was um, in his prison, the Bible says that he was witnessing all the way to the end. At uh, chapter 28, Acts chapter 28, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Wow, I find that cool that he, while the guards are coming in and switching posts, the Apostle Paul is still witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And won't it be neat someday in heaven to meet some of those prison guards who received Christ as, at the witness of the Apostle Paul. And won't it be great when we get to heaven to the glory of God that he was able to use us to either sow the seed or he, he possibly water the seed or maybe even see the fruit of somebody get saved. Won't it be great when we hear our Savior say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and we have fruit to our account? Now we don't do what we do exclusively for that fruit, but that's going to be a great day. I want to do my best for the Lord. I want to share it when He encourages me to share it. I want to be more faithful in this area of the mission that God has for our life, to let our light shine and to show it and to share it to the lost and dying world around us. I really think we all as Christians need to be charged up about this. It needs to be a passionate pursuit of all of our existence. We are here primarily for the purpose of the glory of God, and primarily we glorify God by living a testimony that shares the life of Christ and by sharing the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is it. And it doesn't matter if you're the evangelist or you're the pastor or if you're working a secular job. All of us are to be a part of this great, great and grand mission. And all of us, including me, can do much better. And they're all around us. I wonder, do you know somebody in your sphere of influence that's unsaved? That you need to be more passionate about sharing and showing the love of Christ in, in, out of your life? You say, I don't, know, I don't know anybody. Well, there's plenty out there to get to know. So go get to know some, other, some lost people. Pastor and I were talking about this. I know you guys have a visitation here. You ought to be involved as much as you can in any outreach ministry of your church. Anytime you can. Anytime you can. I know you can't always come. But, you know, getting involved in the community or inviting people into your home or building relationships and asking people to go out to eat with you, starting conversations. We live in a society of selfishness, and I know this is more difficult with technology these days because people are stuck on their phones, and they oftentimes don't want to build friendships with other people. But that shouldn't stop us from trying. And as a church and as individuals getting out in the community and, and making the light of Christ very obvious, making it like it's not a ho-hum thing to be a Christian, well, that's the best thing. It's the best thing I know, the songwriter says. And so as, as a church, as individuals and as a church, can I charge us all up as an evangelist here tonight to go out into this world and to, to fulfill the mission of God? If Nike has a mission and Starbucks, by all means, has a mission, you and I need a mission. A mission that's commanded, communicated, and concluded, let us be faithful to be a witness, a light to the lost, as we sang a moment ago, bold in our testimony, bold in our dialogue with people. Father, would you work in our midst? I'm convicted in my own heart that I need to be more faithful in this. It is not just good enough for me to run a, a camp ministry where people preach the gospel, including myself, publicly. But I need to be advancing the gospel personally. And you've challenged my heart to do better, Lord. I pray that I'd be more faithful. It is definitely an area that the devil can just kind of suck us into being complacent, selfish, where we just think about our day and our time and our 
relationships, and we forget that there's people all around us that need the Lord, that are dying and going through a devil's hell. May we not be insensitive to that. Would you awaken us? Would you take the blinders off of our eyes and help us to see people in need? And I pray in this invitation time that we would do business with you. You would help us to pray for those that are around us that need Christ and help us to be courageous to share our faith. Dare to stand as the choir sang. Being a faithful man or woman to serve the Lord in this way. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's just quietly stand to our feet. I believe it would be important in this last service that if God has spoken to your heart that you would just come and maybe kneel and pray for God to give you the courage to be the witness that you need to be. What that says is individually, yes, but even as others come around you and pray for a particular person or for your work associates or for your community. I think that would be a great thing to do as a church that we would all tonight, as we conclude this service, pray, Lord, help, help me to fulfill. Help me to join with the others in this church to fulfill the great commission of God. Just come. Just come and kneel here at the front. Some are coming. You need to come. I would encourage you. Think of somebody that you can pray for. Somebody that you need to share the gospel with. And as a church... That God would bring lost souls into this church so they can hear the gospel and be saved. Name that name, that specific person that you're burdened for. Maybe it's a neighbor, a coworker, a friend. Pray for your community. Pray that God would use you in this church, in this neighborhood for to be a lighthouse just stay here for a moment and just a moment I'll have brother Brad just have a closing prayer to pray for Central Baptist Church to be faithful in this this area and that all of us would find that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls, he that winneth souls is wise. Graciousness, passing the truth of God with a spirit of, of joy to the lost people around us, seeking to help them know the truth. God help us in this endeavor. Pastor, why don't you come and just pray for the church and for the folks that are kneeling here. Lord, thank you for those that maybe you have brought a name across our mind. We interact with them maybe often, maybe live beside them. They may be in our own homes. Maybe our school, our sport teams. And Lord, for some reason, you have put their name in our hearts and our minds. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here tonight that has that desire to both recognize their mission and accept it. So Lord, I'm asking you now to create an opportunity for conversation. Do a work that we can't do in their heart. You will draw them to yourself. So Lord, may we not miss the opportunity. May we have the courage. Sometimes it's, it's scary. You don't know how they will re react, respond. But Lord, let us just be obedient and follow you. And Lord, I pray that someone would not spend one second in hell because of our obedience. Lord, thank you for the willingness of each one tonight to follow your mission for their life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can return to your seats when you're finished. great message, great reminder for each of us. You know, it's not mission impossible. 
it's mission complete whenever we're obedient. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited what the Lord's going to do. Uh, the Lord can do so much to a, a person willing to be used. So may we just be a usable vessel and may we be faithful. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of uh, Brother Mike in preaching, his friendship and his uh, willingness to come and to preach. I'm thankful for uh, Miss Amy and Micah McKenna and their willingness to come. I'm thankful that he likes good coffee, not black coffee. Really appreciative of that, the good stuff. Uh, I appreciate his time and being here. Uh, we're going to be dismissed. Parents, don't forget to run and get your kiddos. Uh, but if you'd like, make sure you come up. Tell them thank you. Uh, let them know you're going to pray for them. Pray for Southland. Uh, you all know my heart for camp, and I love camp. So uh, pray for Southland. Pray for the staff. Pray for uh, teenagers to be saved and uh, teens to just give their life to the Lord. Say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that, that, that's all I want. I would follow you and wherever you want me to go and do. And uh, I know they would really appreciate that. Pray for their safety going back. Uh, Brother Mike, thank you for coming. Thank you for preaching. And uh, thank you for being here. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday school, and Sunday morning, Sunday night. I hope that uh, you're, you'll be uh, ready and willing for whatever God has for you. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Mike Myers if you'd close this. Up.